2020 that you're looking forward to to working with in your productions? Uh, the question was, is there any tech in 2020 that we're looking forward to in productions, let's say, they have to do with HDR? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Um, I would say that, um, again, again, kind of what, what Brad said and, and um, what Carrie just said about, uh, and, and Paul about on set. Um, I would say the Apple XDR monitor will be one of the strong contenders for, let's say, the VFX community. Uh, because having $30,000 monitors in large quantities is, is cost prohibitive. Um, also space prohibitive and so on. Uh, the Apple XDR monitor will be the first iteration of a high performing, affordable, professional reference display. So uh, there's excitement surrounding that product. Um, but the evolution of HDR displays, just like HD displays 10 years ago, is just a matter of, you know, a maturity timing thing. So Hollywood, specifically, is in need of a fast solution. We don't always get it, right? So we have to be really clever looking for that stuff. But the, the tools are out there, the prices will come down. And to Carrie's point about the costs, I think it's fair to put pressure on the rental industry that they need to provide these tools because they're actually not, they're expensive to the individual. If you're outfitting your kit, this stuff is murder. But when people are renting materials, a lens is, one lens is $30,000, right? A dolly is $100,000. So it's like when you factor in a $30,000 monitor across um, rental, Markets. It's actually not that cost prohibitive as long as they're willing to take the plunge. That plunge is only going to be willing to be taken if we apply pressure <coughs> in those places so that your TV shows actually have HDR on the set and it's not a premier item. It should become a normal item for, let's say, Marvel deliveries. I also think uh, there is, uh, just in short, uh, anytime that you can use real light on a set, uh, uh, Meaning that a, a cinematographer that I worked with, Claudio Miranda, who did Tomorrowland, uh, he uh, he uses uh, projection lights on set. So when he did Oblivion, he shot Oblivion. Uh, they uh, had a set that was supposed to be up in the clouds. It was supposed to be a, a, a sort of a house floating up in the clouds, and. He went through the trouble of having everything outside of the windows projections. And what it did was it, you know, they were really giving him a hard time while he was trying to set it up. But once he set it up, all the reflections in the house were reflections of real clouds that were outside the windows. Now everything was a projection, but it was a high, you know, definition projection. And all the light that bounced around the set was real light. And it made it completely convincing looking. And it saved them a ton of money on effects because it was in-camera effects. So that's a super high-tech version of what they used to do in silent films, where they would do uh, a matte painting uh, live on while they're filming it. They would do a glass painting and shoot it in one take. And there was no optical process. And there, I think that those things are getting more elaborate all the time. And HDR comes into play because what they're projecting is HDR as well as how they're acquiring that image. What about professional slash filmmaker mode on consumer display as an option? See, I didn't put oh. that in. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that, that, uh, there's a thing going on the oh. Directors Guild right now uh, where a lot of pissed off filmmakers are tired of, um, you know, they crank up the TV sets in, in Best Buy to, to like blind you, um, and the consumer starts going, golly, I want to get me one of them blinder TVs. And, and uh, it doesn't have anything to do with what the filmmakers wanted the image to be. So, of course, consumers can consume however they want. But the Directors Guild has been pressing for a button that you could press on any monitor that aligns the image and syncs it up with what the filmmakers intended it to be. So for those people who care, 
about uh, you know seeing it the way it was meant to be seen, there will be a button that you can press, and it will go, whoop, and it will hopefully be the standards set by the cinematographers and the sound mixers. It will you know balance the sound, and uh, uh, you know that should be available to people. Great. Okay, I have another question right here. Brown hat. It was brought out that with HDR and pre-production, there's a lot more testing, which could be a little bit more expensive to prevent issues in post-production. In terms of cost effect, does it balance out, or is that, could that be used as rationalization to do all the pre-testing? It'll save you a ton of money. Um, uh, the, the doing, doing tests up front, um, yeah, production is always going to complain. I'm the post guy going, hey guys, we need to test this. But it's because they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> because the money, the money you will spend in post fixing that um, or reshooting it will outweigh far, far out be a, a higher expense. And how does it relate uh, pre HDR productions in terms of cost? Well, along with HDR that we now have, um, I've also come to other things, is enormous monitors. Um, you know, the size of monitors that most people have have doubled in the last few years, and as well as our streaming services, which um, have a much more stringent QC process than any of the network's uh, cable providers have ever had in the past. So you have the audience looking at a higher quality image, larger image, which you'll see more, uh, at home, and then you have the, the QC process that you have to get through, which is is quite rigorous, takes takes a lot of time, and the more things you catch, the more the meter just keeps running on, on the effects. You're handing off the effects so they can paint out the, the water bottle on the floor, um, or, the, or the cables in the corner, or that makeup doesn't look quite right. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you know, one of the, the great benefits that have also come along in the same time with HER is our uh, software-based color correction tools, which are amazing what we can do in color now. Um, that it just all adds to the quality of the, the product that's able to be out there. And as, as you mentioned earlier, we want to spend that time on creative pursuits in post-production and in color. We don't want to spend time fixing things that shouldn't have been shot that way in the first place. We probably have time just for one more question, okay, right over here. So if the jump from SDR to HDR has kind of unlocked the creative potential for filmmakers, where do any of you see the next hard limit going to be that's going to be reining people in until a new technology comes along and breaks through that? Well, I, I hope there's no hard limit. Um, <laughs> I mean, the hype will freaking hurt. It sounds kind of punitive. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I think that the cost for originating, the cost for displays that will display something that the filmmakers wanted, you know, expected it to do, I think those costs are going to go, go down. So you're going to have this enormous canvas to work with and, and, and tell stories with, you know, oh, what was it used at that along with an enormous canvas as an enormous responsibility? <laughs> I don't know, Brad was all his part of <laughs> But you, you have to take that and, and not overuse it. You have to, it, it's like all of a sudden you, you have subwoofers and movie theaters. And, you know, if you're going to play tons of bass all the time, the audience, you just know that whole storytelling experience. So I, I think that the, the exciting thing is, is take what you feel tells a story and really paint that texture and taste into it um, and find where you can go with it, explore it, because it'll be more accessible to you. Yeah, I think that uh, oftentimes people forget that it's what you don't do. Um, in, in great sound mixes, there are moments of complete silence and that uh, a lot of filmmakers uh, get a brand of, of flop sweat, uh, which is uh, the bigger the budget goes and the more hand-wringing from the studio, 
the more you feel like you've got to just make everything explode every 10 seconds and you know this, that, uh, we had 400 explosions in the last movie, we've got to have 800 in this one because da da da, you know, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not really storytelling anymore. And, and uh, that's why I thought it was so clever, um, a, a, quiet, a quiet place, uh, because it was using um, the lack of sound as a suspense device. And, and it, it worked was so effective on audiences because they hadn't had real silence in, in a scary movie for a long time. It seemed like a new thing. But it's, it's actually, you know, uh, uh, the best sound designers know when to keep quiet. The best composers know when not to play music. Uh, the best directors know when not to have motion on the screen. And uh, it's just like a pianist. It's part of the music is the pause between the notes. You know, and, and we, we can't forget that as storytellers. It's not using everything every moment. It's also when to back off, because that's what makes it effective when we do use it. All right, well, I want to thank our panel for a great session today. I hope it answered some questions. our careers, to quote Mr. Leon Silverman, and uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of the day.